Amen. Grab your Bible, turn to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to go to chapter 12, which is where we were last week, and I just want to give a brief summary of last week and then pull us into chapter 13 where we'll, where we'll focus today. Last week, we talked about purpose. We talked about the purpose of Jesus and the purpose of our lives, and I've been receiving feedback throughout the week. Thank you for sending me emails of how God is using you in this and how he has impacted you by, by just a couple words spoken out of the Word of God. God's Word is alive and powerful. It's like a two-edged sword. It cuts all the, the stuff around and allows his message to come into our hearts. So get ready for it. In Matthew, or, I'm sorry, John chapter 12, verse 27, we looked at that last week. It says, Jesus speaking, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, say this purpose. This purpose, this purpose I came to this hour. There's a timing from God to fulfill a purpose. That's what we talked about last week. The verse previous says, again, Jesus speaking to you and me, if anyone serves me, let him follow me, for, and where I am, there my servant will be also. Well, we're not going to be with Jesus in heaven. Yeah, we are one day, but not today. But we are where, we, where he is in fulfilling the will of the Father. We can be there every single day. And then he says, if anyone serves me... Let him, him my father will honor. So remember, God has a purpose for you. This is the time to start to fulfill it. Enjoy yourself as you do it. So now, let me go into chapter 13. And if you, if you look at chapter 13, you'll see where it starts off with uh, Jesus coming in. He says, um, uh, let me just back up here. It says, now, before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to end, to the end. And then it talks about the supper. So this is the Thursday night before the Friday when he was crucified. And it's a powerful time. Imagine in your mind if you can. He was aware of all that was going to transpire. Jesus knew the passion that was ahead of him. He knew what was coming. He knew the betrayal of Judas. He knew Judas had already gone and, and made the deal, you know, the, to, to get the, the, the coins, uh, the money to betray Jesus. He knew all of that. And yet he was there with the disciples, all 12, including Judas, were there. And that night, and they just walked all the way through the, the hillsides, through the dusty streets of Jerusalem, and came to their place of supper. Can you help me? I need somebody to help me on stage today. And uh, uh, who, who, who would that be? Okay, I see. Come on up here. Yeah, Leave your little one behind. Take, bring your mask with you now. Thank you, my friend. Come on, put it together for Kerwin now. <laughs> Praise God. And so we stand together. And, and so can you, can you imagine what that must have been like? Have a seat, my friend. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Jesus was there with his 12 disciples. He knew one was going to betray him. He knew within hours he was going to be taken into custody forcefully, beaten, bruised. And yet he was there looking, listening to his disciples. And do you know what they were doing? If you read the, the, the expanded version of John chapter 13, it's found in Luke chapter 22. They were arguing with one another about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of God. They were talking about, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. They, they were boasting. And in the midst of that supper, Jesus did something very special. He took off his, uh, his robe, his outer robe. Thank you. And he went to where his disciples were. And he understood the culture of the day was because they'd been walking on the dusty streets and come in and only had sandals on, that their feet were dirty, and normally a servant would have taken care of that. But, and, and when there was no servant there, they would help one another to, to just take care of a natural process. 
But they were so busy looking at themselves and how good they were that Jesus took the opportunity to come to his disciples and to let them know that they were important to him and that he understood the practical needs that were there. And Jesus humbled himself. Did you catch that? He humbled himself. He took off their socks that, praise God, were put on this morning. And he washed their feet. He took the place of a servant and he recognized the hand of God upon these young men. Because many of them were just young men. I believe that Jesus, who was a man of prayer, was praying for them, was believing God while he had his hands on their body. And just as Kerwin was a man of God, called by God, faithful in family, believing for God's hand to use him. So Jesus washed the feet of each one of those disciples. Whether it was Peter who often got himself in trouble by talking ahead of time. Or whether it was John that was nice and close to him. Or whether it was Thomas, Thomas who needed help to believe. Or even if it was Judas, he still humbled himself and washed their feet. So I pray for Kerwin. I pray, Lord, for your hand upon his life. I pray for his household, Father. I call forth the gifts of God from the inside of him that you've placed there. I call them into action and activity now in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, I pray for safety over his household. We put a hedge of protection around them in the mighty name of Jesus. We humbly stand with him for your work to continue in his life. Bless him, Father, in everything he does. In Jesus' name, thank you. See, the Bible helps us understand that Jesus didn't come to be served, did he? He came to serve. He came to seek and to save those who are lost, us. He came to bring about his will in our lives. He came as a servant, as a man. He humbled himself and gave up all the glory that he ever had in heaven just to come to planet Earth so that he could help us. And now what did he say? He said, you've seen me do this. And now I want you to do it with one another, to care for one another, to serve one another, to stand together with one another, to demonstrate his love. I'll let you tuck it right back on. Thank you so much, my brother. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See, this is real, friends. This is what God's called for us. I love what it says in Philippians chapter 2. It says this, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man, it says. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself, And became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Can you see how important it is to have humility in your heart? To have a humble heart where you're not lifting yourself up. We're not thinking we're better than anybody else. But we're understanding that God is at work in us. Has a plan for us. And wants us to cooperate with his plan. If you're still in John chapter 13, look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, and since I, your Lord and teacher, did you catch that? 
He was their Lord and their teacher. And yes, he humbled himself. Since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. No, I don't have bowls of water for everybody, and maybe at home you don't either. That's not the point. It's the heart, the attitude behind it. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves or servants are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the messenger. Point number one, humility is needed for every believer to please God. Are you ready? You ready to live that out? Amen. Amen. Jill, why don't you come? And how did he have an attitude of a servant? You know, it says, for God so loved the world. Love always motivates servanthood. And Jesus loved everyone. He didn't see one person different than another. He didn't pick out, well, you don't think like me, so I'm not going to talk with you. Everyone was equal in his eyes. It didn't matter if you were the richest person or the poorest person. God so loved the world. And as believers, as followers of Jesus, we need to be ones that love one another. But not just love one another in the church, but love everyone the way Jesus did. And we develop that by loving him first. Because the more we love him, the more his character takes over. The more his character takes over, that love will flow to others. It will flow to those ones that we couldn't in the natural easily love. It would flow to those ones that look different than us, dress different than us, smell different than us. It will override the natural senses, the natural thoughts, and the love will take over. In John 13, in verse 34, many of you are familiar with these verses. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He repeats it. It must be important. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You see, there is a focus on the love, that we allow his love, because you see, the natural love of life is determined by what you do for me. But his love overrides what you do for me, and it loves you despite what you do for me. It loves you whether you do anything or not, because his love reaches out into the hearts of each and every person and sees the value in each and every person, because each person has great value, because he created us, and he created us as individuals to allow his love to flow. But you see, as we saw through this exercise, his love was moved by action. Love always has an action. Love never stands still. There is always an action that proceeds. And love moves us to service. When the true love of God overwhelms us, we are moved to service. And as we're moved to service, then we touch other people's lives. And God moves in them and starts to change them. But sometimes we get jealous, and sometimes we let the natural feelings come in because we step out in love, and we start to love, and we move in service. But then somebody seems to move ahead of us that we were helping, and we get pushed back, and we no longer want to love that person because what about me? I'm the one that gave you that. I'm the one that taught you. I'm the one that helped you. Or sometimes we don't want to listen because they aren't saying what we want to hear. But, you know, we heard Pastor Kathleen. Sometimes you just need somebody to listen. You don't want a response. Love doesn't always tell people what to do. Love sometimes just listens. But, you know, the most important thing is that we develop that relationship of love with Jesus. Because the more we love him, the more we fall in love with him, the more we will love others. The more God will help us 
And I found that even in situations where I didn't like the situation I was in, if I would draw on his love, he would let me see differently than my natural eyes were seeing. He would give me thoughts and words that would help the situation. You see, love goes beyond a feeling. Love moves into change. It moves into service that brings about God's presence and atmosphere. Love will change the atmosphere so that God can move. When we bring God's love into a situation, the atmosphere starts to change. Between services, Pastor Harrison was telling me that 15 years ago, he was talking to a man, and they became friends. And then all of a sudden, it was like the man just cut him off. And he was trying to share God's love with him and, and, and speak to him, but the man just cut him off. And out of the blue, just recently, the man called him. And over these 15 years, the seeds of love that he started to plant, somebody came along and watered. And as they watered them, that man's heart has totally turned around. You see, we put everything into time. We put everything into what we see, hear, and feel. But when we let the love of God flow, when we let the love of God just move, God will take a heart and he will change it. Timing is not up to you and I. Our job is to be those ones that love. And as we love, God will move on our behalf. As we love, God will give us servant hearts to do what we didn't think we could do, to go to places we never thought we could go. And as we do, God will move. I am one that knows without a shadow of a doubt. I was a five-star hotel lady. Don't take me anywhere else. I would check to make sure it was clean. But see, God changed my heart. I started praying for a map of the world. I started looking up in encyclopedias about the people in the different countries and praying over them. And all of a sudden, God put a love in my heart that wasn't there before. And things that used to bother me didn't bother me anymore. Think, things that I couldn't move in, I could now move in because of the love of God. And the love of God moved me to serve. It moved me to help them. It moved me to do whatever I could do to make a difference. Little did I know that many years later, I would find myself in a city where the world lives, where the world has come together. You see, God knew all along. He was preparing me years ago, and I didn't even know it. But as I submitted to him, because you see, love is a choice. Love is not a feeling. It's not if you do this, I'll do this. It's not if you say what I want to say, I will love you. Love is a choice. I choose to love people that are different than me. I choose to love those that disagree with me. I choose to love those that eat food I don't like. I choose to love. I choose to love. And as we choose, God's presence overtakes us. And his grace comes upon us. And as his grace comes upon us, there's nothing we can't do. There's nowhere we can't go. And there's nobody that can stop us because God's love will supersede everything because he so loved the world. And in just a few weeks, we're going to join together and we're going to remember what Jesus did. And we're going to celebrate his resurrection, because his life is alive today, and it is flowing through you and I. And as we continue to walk in the love he has given us, then we will see many more come to him. We will see things that we couldn't change, change. His love is power. His love is power, and that power will work on your behalf. Have you received God's love? We receive it for ourselves, right, so we enjoy it. But it's not a gift for us to only enjoy. It's a gift for us to share it with those around us. That's why I like what it says. You will know them. The people around about us will know us 
as believers because of our love for one another. That we care for one another. That's what, one of the things I love about BCF Church. More than 50 different national backgrounds, but no division. No thinking one nationality is better than another. We love one another just because Jesus loves us. Isn't that true? Let's finish up our story today. While they're in that, in that room, Jesus starts to reveal a little bit about what's coming ahead of him. He starts to reveal about um, the, the hours that are next on his agenda and how there's going to be uh, turmoil and there's going to be some trouble. And Peter says, um, I'll stand with you. I'll never leave you. I'll die for you, he says. Do you remember Jesus' response? Jesus loves to tell the truth because he saw something. He saw a desire in Peter to do the right thing. But it went beyond that desire and it went into the area of pride that I can do it. That I'll never leave you. If others, if others leave you, I never will. You can count on me. It sounds good, but the root of it really is pride. And so Jesus addressed it with him. He said, will you lay down your life for me? Verse 38. Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Has pride ever tried to rise its head in your life? Have, we, have you ever thought, yeah, I, I can do this by myself. I, I, I'm going to do it. I've got enough determination to be able to make it happen. That was Peter. Did Jesus push him aside and throw him away? Not at all. But he told him the truth. He told him that pride comes before a fall. Writer of Proverbs told us that. But Jesus saw it in front of him in the life of Peter. Sometimes he sees that in us as well. So what do we do? Go back to point number one. Humble ourselves. And then stand strong and believe that God will help us to do all things. But without him, John chapter 15, verse 7, without Jesus, we can do nothing. So we need to draw on his strength, on his grace to help us through in every situation. And we can boldly say that, yes, with God's help, I will do this. With God's help, I will make it through. What if we get into pride and we fall? Well, as I mentioned earlier, Luke 22 tells a bigger portion of this story, all the intricate details. And in there, Jesus actually talked to Peter and said, Peter... I prayed for you, for the enemy desired to sift you like wheat. That meant they threw them up in the air and let the wind blow it away and blow the chaff away. And sometimes the winds, uh, uh, storms of life are there and we feel thrown up in it. Satan wants to sift us to see what's real and what's not real. But Jesus said this, but Peter, I have prayed for you. What is Jesus doing now? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Interceding. interceding, making intercession for you, for you, for each one of us. He's making intercession for us, praying for us that we will do what? That we will fulfill all that God has spoken about us. He's praying for you. But at the end of that verse out of Luke says, and when you're restored... Jesus' prayer did not stop Peter's pride, but it restored Peter. It brought him back. It brought him back into a place of humility. He said, when you're restored, strengthen your brethren. And so that's what Peter did. He stood up again, and he, even though he backed down to those little, little maidens on that tragic night, he still fulfilled his destiny is one of the greatest leaders the church has ever seen. That's what I believe for you, my friends. You may fall down, rise up, and stand up again. And repent. If you've been heading the wrong direction, turn around and go the right direction. Never let a failure stop you. 
but let it bring humility so that you can stand before Almighty God and worship Him again and receive His destiny. Can we pray today? Father, we stand together as brothers and sisters nearby and far away. We stand with Brian who's traveling. We stand with Pearl in her home. We stand with all of our friends here in house. Lord, we stand together in faith, believing that what you've done in the past, you continue to do today. You've called us to be like you, Jesus. You said that we're to grow more like you every single day. So Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We, we surrender our will. We say, not my will, but your will be done. Do you say that? Go ahead. Not my will, but Not your will. will be done, Lord. But your will be done. See, we stand together in this. And then there may be a couple. There may be some here today who never, ever surrendered your life to Jesus. Well, this is a beginning. This is a start. He believes in you. Maybe you've never believed in him as a Lord. You've just known him as a personality. But God wants you to know Jesus as a personal friend that would never leave you. And he's looking for you to surrender your life to him today. Why don't you pray this simple prayer with me right now? You just pray it out loud. Others, let's help. Say, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Yeah, yeah, right out loud. Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for sending Jesus. To die for me. To die for me. Take my sins away. Take my sins away. Allow me to have a relationship with you. Allow me to have a relationship with you. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe in you, Jesus. And I will serve you, Lord. And I will serve you, Lord. From this day forward. From this day forward. Amen. Amen. You know, if you prayed that prayer, we have friends online and friends here that can help you with it. They can give you a, a, a little hint, some hints on how to live it out. In fact, if you let us know online, we have a, an ebook that we'll send you that will really help you. If you're here in-house, we have one back at our VIP booth that we'll give to you as well. Because God wants us to serve him with gladness every single day. Is that right? Thank you so much for being with us today. I trust that the Word of God impacted your heart just the way it did mine. Remember, if you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that right now. And then tell a friend so they can join us and be online with us each week. If you'd like to help us be able to continue this ministry around the world, you can do so by clicking the link below. And I believe God's going to bless you as you bless many others. Have a great week. God bless you.